Um, it looks like it's 12 o'clock here, so I'm going to go ahead and start. If anybody joins in, um, they can absolutely, uh, absolutely join in um, and kind of catch up. So there is just a few housekeeping items that I would like to go. Actually, first of all, I'll introduce myself. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Danielle Neese. I'm the Provincial Pesticide Investigator with the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, I've been in this role for about three years now, and actually I believe I presented at, um, I can't remember where it was, uh, but the Pest Control Officer Conference um, uh, a couple years ago. So um, some of you may remember me from that presentation. If not, um, then yes, my name's Danielle. And uh, I want to go over a couple housekeeping items before we start off here. So um, first thing is uh, getting used to trying to do presentations on Teams or on uh, electronic format. It can add a few challenges. One of the things I would like to remind everybody is if you're not um, if you're not talking, so asking a question or anything, please ensure that you're um, that you are on mute. Uh, sometimes, not that you know, even if it's quiet where you are. Um, the video, sometimes there's a little bit of a lag between the video coming in and the video going out. So it'll create an echo because the your microphone will pick up the recording um, or the the presentation audio, which will then echo with um, my speaking. So um, it, the mute button is at the top, uh, should be at the top of everybody's screen. It looks like a little microphone. If your microphone has a line through it, it is muted. If it's no line through it, you're not on mute. Um, I do have the um, the ability to hit mute all. So if someone becomes unmuted, um, I can hit mute all and then just unmute myself. So um, that's the first thing I want to go over. Uh, sometimes with the presentations, especially with a large number of people attending, they can there can be a little bit of um, uh, delays for. Um, basically uh, delays in the internet and so sometimes it'll freeze or glitch. One of the things that I do ask is when the presentation is going on, if you could turn off your video, you still will be able to um, to see me and the presentation. It just won't send your video back to me and I do like to see everyone that um, that I'm presenting to but sometimes it does cause delays or issues with the internet connection. So again, right beside your mute button, there's a little camera button. If you click on that, it'll put a line through the camera and that means your video is off. Um, again, I can turn off the incoming video. So uh, if your presentation is um, kind of glitching or pausing, that's just, uh, and you have your incoming video off, if you turn that off, it, turn that off or outgoing video, sorry, that's the video sending from your computer to me, uh, that does help. Um, one of the other things I do want to, just up at the top here, there's a couple things I want to uh, bring your attention to. So there is a chat box and a couple of you have found the chat box here. It looks like a little um, speech bubble. And if you have any questions or anything, that is an option to use that to you can type your questions in there. I do kind of keep an eye on it while I'm doing my presentation. So if you do have any questions there, um, right next to that at the top of your screen, there is a um, raise hand icon. And that basically it puts up your hand electronically so that I can see it um, on my end. If you have a question, you can either type it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, if I don't notice that your hand is has been raised, you can unmute your microphone and just say I have a question and then um, and then I can address that. Uh, there will be a time at the end of the presentation for questions. So if you have any questions and you want to wait till the end of the presentation, I will leave some time to answer those questions at that time. Um, other than that, so we've went over uh, the chat box, raising your hands. Uh, muting yourself. So, um, and we did go over the um, the list. It looks like everyone on the list is identifiable um, by either the name. Some say RM. One says RM uh, RM number. So uh, we can look um, look at that. So I think that is good. Um, I will be recording this. 
presentation. Uh, the reason we're recording it is for future reference. Um, so just to let everyone know that this presentation will be recorded. If for some reason you um, get uh, it kicks you out or something and you're not able to rejoin, that is an option. Um, but just uh, just so you're aware that it is being recorded. Other than that, I think that's about it for housekeeping items. Um, I will be taking an attendance list. I will do it about halfway through the presentation. And again, just before I open it up for questions. The reason I'm doing it twice is just in case somebody um, got, you know, got kicked out or uh, something um, when I do it the first time. So we'll make sure that everyone gets their credits for this. Uh, this is a this is a credit session. So um, other than that, I'm just going to roll right into the presentation here. It's about five minutes, six minutes after 12. So uh, it gives gave people a few extra minutes to join if they haven't uh, already. And you should be able to see my presentation up um, as well as my video. So uh, if that disappears or for some reason you're not seeing it, somebody, anybody raise your hand or whatever and just say, hey, your presentation is not showing. Um, other than that, I'm going to take it away here. And um, so first of all, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, it's nice with the weather out today that we didn't have to go outside to attend, uh, attend this presentation. So um, it's uh, pretty chilly out today. So as I said before, I'm the pesticide provincial pesticide investigator with the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, one of the things I like to let people know, this is because this is a credit session, it's highly likely that all of you are licensed applicators. So this isn't going to be anything too um, too crazy, too new. It's it's a lot of information that you already know. It's more like a, a review or refresher. And um, having said that, I do ask if you do have any questions or anything as we're going, um, you can feel free to ask those. Or again, you can wait till the question uh, the question and answer time at the end of the presentation. If you do have a question and you want to wait, if you want to just jot it down on a piece of paper or you so you uh, so it stays fresh in your mind, um, that that's okay. Um, it, I find this is a lot more. It's a little more difficult doing it um, online because I can't see you, and um, sometimes you know I can if I can see someone has a question or something. So um, so I apologize for that, but that is what we have to do now. Um, it is much more beneficial for you as well for me if we um, if we have this you know open open question time just um, because it is a review. So um, I'm going to uh, just here we go. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to be touching on a few areas. So. This presentation is about pesticide, um, is the pesticide label presentation, but I will be touching on a few other things as well. So during this presentation, we'll talk about what is a pesticide. I always start with this one just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, who regulates and licenses pesticide application in Saskatchewan? Uh, which government is responsible for what? That can be a little bit, a little bit unclear as it kind of uh, overlaps. A little bit about the federal and provincial legislation that government governs pesticide use in Saskatchewan. Uh, a brief introduction into safety data sheets. Uh, and then we'll move right into the label. So what is um, what is on a primary display label? What is on the secondary display label? Um, and then we're going to just talk a little bit about public trust. So um, I usually ask if there's any questions. There's not really anything too shocking here, but I'm just going to carry on here. So uh, if I do forget to advance the slides because I'm looking at multiple screens here, again, someone just throw your hand up and say, hey, we can't see that. So um, first of all, we're going to start off with um, what is a pesticide? I know you're probably wondering why I might have included this slide. It seems like it would be common knowledge to someone who uh, makes a living applying pesticides. However, I frequently have applicators say things like, it's not a pesticide, it's only Roundup, or it's not a pesticide, it's an insecticide. So just to get this out of the way and make sure that we're all on the same page, um, we're going to get into this here. So 
The Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of a pesticide is an agent used to destroy pests. Um, the dictionary.com definition of a pest is an annoying or troublesome person, animal or thing or a nuisance or an insect or other small animal that harms or destroys garden plants, trees, etc., or deadly epidemic disease, um, especially a plague. And so we're looking basically at um, definition one and two. So an annoying or troublesome, I'm going to say animal or thing. I don't think um, a person quite fits into our definition, but anyways. Um, and an insecticide or other small animal that harms or destroys garden plants, trees, uh, et cetera. This would include crops. Um, so if we look at the definition of a pesticide, we can conclude that there are many types of pesticides used today. Um, there's um, in this presentation, when I'm referring to a pesticide, I'm referring mostly to herbicides, fungicides and insecticides. Those I believe would be um, uh, rodenticides as well. Those would kind of be the main areas um, that e you would deal with and sorry, you can just flip my page here. I got too many, too many screens going on here. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, the pesticide regulation and licensing in government of Saskatchewan. So there are four positions within the ministry of agriculture who are responsible for pesticide regulation and applicator licensing. Uh, they are the Provincial Specialist Pesticide Regulatory, that's Richard Wilkins, um, and he is responsible for pesticide regulations, which includes writing and amending legislation such as the Pest Control Products Act and, reg and Pest Control Products Regulations. He's also the person who looks after the Field Watch program. Next is a Provincial Pesticide Investigator, um, myself. And I'm responsible for enforcing the legislation. Uh, one of the things I like to let people know is our approach to enforcement is both proactive through inspections and reactive through complaint driven investigations. And in terms of discipline, we take a graduated approach to enforcement with the first step being education. Um, and so we started education and then it's kind of as incidents happen or severity increases, it goes all the way to at the very end of the day, it could include fines or jail time. So there's a there's a large array of uh, options there, but um, usually it starts off as a, kind of a teachable moment. And um, the next person is our pesticide licensing officer, and that's Cassandra Kitchen. Uh, she's responsible for verifying and processing pesticide license applications and actually issuing the licenses. And last but certainly not least, our administrative support, Tara Knoll, is responsible for answering client questions regarding the licensing application process, directing inquiries to the appropriate areas such as SAS Polytech, and working with the clients, so with, with you guys, to ensure that all required paperwork is in place, um, including copies of um, your certificates of achievement, drift insurance, if applicable, anything like that, and processing the payments. So you would speak with Tara, um, or you would deal with Tara initially in renewing your license and then um, Cassandra Kitchen would be the one that is actually um, is actually responsible for doing producing the license. And um, that uh, with that, that's the Ministry of Agriculture Pesticide Licensing Unit. Um, so we're going to move on here to the responsibilities. Um, pesticide regulation is sh a shared responsibility between the federal government, the provincial or territorial government, and the municipal government. The federal government deals with importation, sale, distribution, manufacture, and use of pesticides, as well as evaluation and registration of pesticides and environmental and health impacts of pesticides. Uh, so anything having to do do with um, registration or anything like that is environmental effects, health impacts, that's all dealt with through the federal government. Um, any pesticide used in Canada has to be registered with the, um, with the federal government and it's a pest management regulatory agency that looks after that registration. If it's used as a pesticide, even if it's all natural products, it doesn't matter, it needs to be registered with, um, with the federal government. And um, so then the provincial government also um, 
the provincial government deals with the transportation, sale, use, storage, and disposal of pesticides, as well as the training, certification, and licensing of applicators, service providers, and vendors. So the applicators would be the people applying the pesticide. The service providers would be um, pesticide application companies. So if somebody has their own company and one of the purposes is to apply pesticides, they would require a service license. And then the vendors, and those are the people that are selling the pesticides. So that would be, um, and anywhere from any retail outlet that sells pesticides, if you're looking at agricultural products, you would look at your um, agricultural input retailers. Um, some places it's, uh, you, you're looking at, you know, Home Depot, um, Rona, Lowe's, those kind of places sell pesticides as well. So it really, um, vendors, anywhere that sells pesticides, that are not domestic use so there's classified as anything other than domestic needs to have a vendor's license uh, that's looked after by the provincial government so the legislation surrounding that and then lastly we have the municipal government and they establish bylaws concerning pesticide use um, with that you can see there's kind of a little bit of overlap between federal provincial and um, and uh, municipal so we're going to move on here to a little bit about the legislation. So there's two pieces of federal legislation and two pieces of provincial legislation that govern the use of pesticides in Canada. The two pieces of federal legislation are the Pest Control Products Act and the Pest Control Products Regulations. There's a link there to where you can find those online. Don't worry about copying it down. If you want to, you can. Um, but I will provide a copy of my presentation to um the phos and you can get a copy of it and it'll have the links and everything so anything that is is a link in the presentation you you can get that right from the presentation um so the pesticide um the labeling of the pesticide is dealt with through the federal legislation and section 22 to 30 of this of the pest control products regulations deals directly with labeling requirements so we'll take a closer look at that coming up in the presentation and the two pieces of provincial legislation are the pest control products saskatchewan act and the pest control products saskatchewan regulations and these can be found again at the the following link there and um they're, they're available online um for free both of them if you want a printed copy sent to i believe you can purchase them online and basically it's just paying for the printing and shipping of them so um we're going to move on here next to SDS or MSDS. Some people know them as MSDS sheets. Um, they're actually, they changed the name now to safety data sheets from material safety data sheets. So um, the, again, they were formerly known as material safety data sheets or MSDS sheets. Anytime you have um, a product that's that can be considered hazardous, you have to have a copy of the material safety data sheets. It has to be available. Um, I know that the MSDS sheets are not labels. However, people often get confused and think that they are interchangeable. They are not suitable substitutes for the product label. They do contain specific information on, um, that is not included in the safety data sheets. So um, you can't say, oh, I have the MSD sheets for all of the products I have. You have to have a copy of the MSD or the SDS sheets as well as, as the product label. Um, the, um, uh, they must be, again, must be kept in addition to the product labels. Um, you have to provide access to all of your employees uh to the sds sheets um it's something workplace safety requires that all employees have um have access to them if they have if there's an opportunity for them to be exposed to the subject um, they can be kept both electronically or in paper i believe for the um, safety data sheets and they do provide um, some product information. Um, it's mostly the product safety information. And they're, they're comprised of um, 16 sections. So 
they, there used to be nine sections in the MSDS sheets, but in 2015, they updated. So when they switched to SDS sheets, they moved it up to 16 sections. Not all sections apply to, or not all sections apply to every product. So um, I'm just going to briefly go over the headings on the SDS sheet. So the first is um, identification. So it has to identify the product that you're using. The hazard identification. So this um, would be the degree of hazard. So um, warning, caution, danger, and what type of hazard it is, explosive, corrosive, those type of things. Um, composition information, uh, uh, compos composition or information on the ingredients in the product. The first aid measures, um, firefighting measures, accidental release measures. So if, uh, if there's a spill or something, handling and storage, um, exposure controls or personal protection required. So that would be your PPE, um, physical and chemical properties of the product, uh, stability and reactivity, uh, toxicological information, ecological information, uh, disposal considerations, transportation information, regulatory information, and then there is a section for any other information required. Um, most of this information can be found on the secondary panel or label of a pesticide. So this information off the SDS sheets can mostly be found in the actual label. Um, even though it can be found in both places, you are still required to, um, to have a copy of both available to your employees. So we're gonna move on here to pesticide labels. Um, the federal government is responsible for pesticide labeling requirements and uh, pesticide labels are considered a legal document uh, that are supported by the federal and provincial legislation. When you purchase and or use a pesticide, you are required by law to adhere to the label specifications. Um, and this is where you will hear um, anyone in my, my position or regulatory positions or anyone in a regulatory position within the federal government uh, say that the ignorance of the law is not an excuse. So one of the things that every label says is you have to read the label before using the product. So um, saying I didn't know is not um, not acceptable. Um, labels for all pesticides registered for use in Canada can be accessed online through the PMRA website. At This is the link here. Again, you can get that link from the presentation, if you contact uh, your PHO, they'll have access to that. Here you can look up a product by name, um, the active ingredient, or the PCP number. Um, one of the issues that I have run into is that you have to have the exact spelling for the name. For example, uh, Roundup, R-O-U-N-D space U-P versus Roundup, R-O-U-N-D-U-P. Um, it brings up two completely different lists. Once you have found the product that you are looking for, you can click on the PCP registration number or the name of the product. If you click on the registration number, it will bring up a copy of the product label. If you click on the product name, it will bring up a copy of the registration information. This is where you would check to ensure that the product is still registered. There are products that were previously registered and are no longer registered. That's where you would find this information. Um, and just to make sure I haven't lost everybody here, I'm just going to ask you to um, throw up your hands if you're familiar with this um, this label, the pesticide label search tool. Um, if there's a lot of people who aren't familiar, I can go on and we can just I can show you kind of what it looks like. If there if there is um, if most people have been on it and are familiar with it, then I won't bother. So I'm just going to give you. Uh, just a few seconds here to throw your hands up so I can kind of see show of hands who's familiar with this. So it looks like we have a good number of people who are raising their hands here. Um, looks like about eight people so far. So I'm going to um, 
If you want to go ahead and click the hand button again, it'll lower your hand here. If if at the at the end there there is there are people who have seen it and there are people who haven't. So at the end, if we have time, um, I'll go into it and just we'll pull something up so we can see that. Um, and uh, then if if someone has already been in it and used it and doesn't want to stay for that, they can just drop off the call. So that that way we can kind of get a get a look at that. Um, all right, I'm just going to move it. Oh, sorry, I got to get the there we go. So this is just a brief, um, a brief, a brief screenshot of it. So here's what the PMR Pest Management Regulatory Agency. So if I say PMRA, I'm sorry, that's just I use it so often that I don't even think about it. That's what it means. Pest Management Regulatory Agency. This is their online search tool. This is just a screenshot, so I can't actually do anything in it. I just I can just uh, show you kind of what it looks like. Um, there is also an app that you can download on your phone um, to to find the same information. So here you can search by the product name, the active ingredient, the PCP number. Um, so for example, I'm just uh, just gonna grab something over here if i'm looking at uh, say i want to look up uh, esplanade i i can search esplanade i can search in dazaflam or i can search uh 31333 which is a pest control products number the pest control products number are specific to that product so i wouldn't i wouldn't uh, if i searched that i would get one response and it would be that one product um, again, like I said, one of the hiccups is if you don't spell, especially when you're looking at active ingredients, if you don't spell it right, you may get uh, quite an extensive list and have to kind of weed through those ones. So, oh, um, so this is uh, an example. If you search for um, PCP uh, 28198 Roundup Transorb or Glyphosate, so if you search either of any of those, so 28198, you would put in that spot, um, Roundup Transorb or Glyphosate, any of those, this is one of the products that would come up. And so if you click on the PCP number, so that is the registration number just to the bottom left kind of of your screen there, that's going to pull up the label. If you click on the product name, so that's kind of in the middle at the bottom of the screen and that shows up, it says Roundup Transorb HC Liquid Herbicide. If you click on there, that will bring up the um, the registration information. So when you click on the pest control products number, it brings up both the primary label and the secondary label. So basically it shows a copy of um, the short version of the label and then behind it, the long version of the label, which a lot of times is just a repeat of the first portion and then it has more information after that. Um, one of this is what the registration page looks like. So I just went with the same product. So you can see here the name of it. Um, the registrant is Monsanto Canada. That is likely changed. This was um, this was just uh, um, just one that I had in the presentation before. Shows you that it's registered. The date it was first registered. Um, and then you'll see there's two blank fields there. If there is any dates in those two fields, so last sale by registrant and last sale by retail, that means that the product is either um, no longer registered, the registration has expired, or it is in the process of being deregistered. So when they when they register or when they have a product that's being deregistered, there is a, what they call a wind down period. So it wouldn't just all of a sudden show that it's not registered anymore. They do allow time for it to kind of um, flow through the retail chain, right from, I guess, production through the retail chain to sale. Um, and so here under the expiry date of registration, you can see this one for this product expires December 31st of 2022. They all expire December 31st. It's just which year. Um, it tells you how it's classified. So this is classified as commercial and restricted use, uses. And then at the bottom, it tells you the active ingredients. So that's um, the glyphosate there. So that's just a, a little bit of information um, about the label search. 
this is a really useful tool. If you look at um, if you look at the product label, the paper copy, some of them I printed one the other day. I can't remember what product it's for, but it's 78 pages. Um, and yes, you have to read the label before you apply the product. But this um, this one, if you needed to find something really quickly, if you go on the online label, you can search for. So if you're looking for just double checking your buffer zones or something, you can uh, search for buffer zones and it'll take you right to that section instead of flipping through a 78 page document. So I do use I do use that a lot. I find it very helpful. So that's just that's a little tip um, tip from me that I find is useful. Um, so next we're going to move on to uh, the label requirements. There are some general label requirements. Um, First of all, just kind of in general, all information on the label must be in both official languages, French and English. Um, the only exception is if the product is not authorized to be manu manufactured, imported, sold, or used in Canada, then it can be either French or English or both. Um, all information that is required to be on the label must be clear, legible, and not able to be removed. Any written, printed, or graphic matter on the marketplace label must not interfere with or detract from the required information. So you shouldn't have to search very hard to find the information that you need. Um, there's, and this this is uh, applies to any product registered by pest management regulatory agency as a pesticide. Anywhere on the label of the product, it cannot be represented as a treatment preventative or cure for any disease that affects either or both humans or domestic animals. And um, so it can't say that you can use this as a treatment for or this will cure. Um, that's not allowed. And there are two parts of um, to a label, the primary display, display label or primary display panel and the secondary display panel. The primary display panel essentially tells you what the product is and identifies if it is has a hazardous substance. The secondary display panel includes this information, but also contains the information on how to use the product, warnings associated with the product, and treatment in the event of an accidental exposure. And I'll go over both of these um, in a little more detail here. And so we're moving on to... Uh, so the principal display panel, um, again, like I said, they're the two main parts. Here are some key pin pieces of information that can be found on the primary or principal primary label of any pesticide or principal display panel. Um, so the class or designation, if you're using a product, it must be classified as an agricultural or commercial product. Um, so for the it depending on where you're using it and what you're using it for um it uh that kind of is where the the uh classification comes comes in and um um so that's just if you look up this one that i have on the screen is uh domestic so you can see just the third line down it says domestic that's classified as a domestic product so anybody can use that product um the um the so in some cases commercial and agricultural products can that can be used interchangeably and uh i'll go into more detail on the classification in just a few minutes i'm just going to cover kind of what's on the label here so the registration number if this is missing you cannot use that product as it is not registered for use in canada and it is against the law to use pest control products that aren't registered in canada you have the guarantee statement, so that's um, that's basically what the active ingredient is. The precautionary symbol. So again, this is where we see um, we see the risk of the hazard as well as what the hazard is. So a hexagon-shaped symbol, such as the one that you see here, means danger. A diamond-shaped symbol means warning, and a triangle-shaped symbol means caution. So caution being the least, um, and then moving up to warning and then danger um, then you'll find the net contents so this one here is uh four liters so you can see that it says net contents and just four liters just below the hazard symbols 
Um, a statement saying that you must read the label before using the product. So on this one, there's the statement right below the net contents. Read the label before using this product um, and French and English. And then it also has the keep out of reach of children and that's standard on, on pesticides as well. So French and English. And then the last thing is the name of the registrant. If you have any product specific questions that you're that aren't answered on the label, this is the information you would, this is the contact information for who you would contact to get answers for that particular product. Um, so we're gonna move on here to, oh, sorry, I forgot that I put the arrow. So product name up at the top, they up at the top there, liquid algicide, uh, domestic product, the registration number is 27623. The guarantee statement is um, that's your active ingredient or guaranteed. This is your precautionary symbol, your net contents right there. Um, read the label before using, keep out of reach of children and the registrant information. So the product name, which may include a distinctive brand or trademark and the common chemical name of its active ingredient. Um, so you see, um, it must also include the product type which must be descriptive of its purpose. So some of the product types we're looking at here would be herbicide, fungicide, insecticide, algicide, rodenticide, um, any, so basically it tells you what type of pesticide it is. Um, so when we talked about what is a pesticide, and I think I kind of breezed over this part, I might have not mentioned it. So the pesticide is kind of the umbrella term Everything, so herbicide, rodenticide, fungicide, insecticide, all of those are under that umbrella term of pesticide because the pest part um, can be interchangeable with what it is trying to uh, destroy or repel. So um, herbicide repels plants, fungicide repels funguses or disease, insecticide, rodenticide, so on. Um, it also has to list the physical form of the product, such as liquid, wettable powder, pressurized spray, etc. And um, here's a sample from current label for microscopic sulfur. Um, oh. So microscopic sulfur, wettable powder, fungicide. So that includes all of those, those pieces. And so the classification of pesticides. So there are currently four classifications of pesticides in Canada. They can be found in the Pest Control Pro Products Regulations Section 5. The four classifications are domestic, and if the pest control product is to be distributed primarily to the general public for personal use in or around their homes, it would be classified as domestic. So this is um, your uh, personal bug sprays, so um, kind of off your your Roundup or uh, glyphosate that you can get uh, just for home garden use, those kind of things. Um, any of the uh, rodenticides you would use to um, take care of rodent problems within the home, insecticides. These are the ones that can be sold uh, at any retailer. So your Home Depots, your Walmarts, your co-op home centers, um, any of those, they, they don't require a license to sell those products and anybody can buy or use those products. If you are using them um, as a licensed applicator, if you're applying them for gain or reward, you do you are required to, um, to be licensed. So uh, the next is the commercial commercial products. If the pest control product is to be distributed for use in commercial activities that are specified on the label, including uh, agricultural, they would be classified as commercial. So, and this is where I said commercial and agricultural can be used interchangeably in some circumstances. And uh, the next is restricted. And the if the pest control product is one for which the minister out of concern for its health or environmental risks has set out additional information to be shown on the label concerning essential conditions respecting, sorry, respecting the display distribution or limitations on use of or qualifications of persons who may use the product. It would be 
basically it would be labeled as restricted. So for restricted products, not anybody can buy them. You have to be licensed to purchase them and um, absolutely have to be licensed to use them. And so then the last classification is manufacturing. And if the pest control product is to be used only in the manufacture of a pest control product or product regulated under the Feeds Act or Fertilizer Act, it would be um, it'd be classified as manufacturing. In the pest control product regulations, it only lists four classifications. However, uh, again, agricultural can be listed under commercial if the pest control product is to be distributed for agricultural purposes as specified on the label. Um, some labels, such as Marksman's, Marksman, say commercial and then have in brackets agricultural. And some products, such as Converge 480, just say agricultural. So um, either way, it's kind of can be used inter interchangeably. If it does state agricultural, though, it is um, it is to be used in agricultural situations. It, I guess it's kind of commercial can include agricultural, but agricultural is more specific. So it, the agricultural pr products need to be used in the agricult for agricultural purposes. Um, it, it, and essentially, I mean, all this to say, if the label says it can be used for a purpose, then it can be used for a purpose. If a label says it doesn't say it can be used for a purpose, then it's not lawful to use it for that purpose. Um, so here I said that I would go over the hazard information. Um, so the signal words and precautionary symbols are, um, um, let's see here. So a statement that indicates the nature of the primary hazard. So we have caution and that's the triangle symbol. So this is what you would see um, on the outside of the symbol. Uh, danger shows the hexagon and or octagon sorry <laughs> and uh warning shows a diamond and then you have basically this is what the risk is so uh the the left side is how how what the um how severe the risk is and the right side is what the risk is so we have things such as corrosive which is this symbol explosive flammable poison there is one that shows an exclamation mark. Uh, this is one I didn't put on here, but it's that's more of a general one where there's not a specific symbol for it. It doesn't quite fit into the other ones. And there is a long list of symbols. These are just some of the common ones. Uh, so if you look at the bottom of the screen there, basically we're saying uh, we have a symbol there. We're saying caution. So it's not, it's the lowest of the risk levels and it's poison. So, um, and the, the toxicity, if higher higher toxicity warrants a uh, stronger symbol. So as you go from caution to danger to warning, if it's extremely toxic, it would have a warning versus a cautionary symbol. Um, so we're going to move on to the principal display panel here. There's other information. So that that is found on the um, principal display panel, but um, this one is uh, the statement read the label before using here's an example right off the product label um, in this case they added end booklet if the product is domestic it does it has to have the statement keep out of reach of children so for agricultural products or commercial products it doesn't necessarily say that but for domestic products it does so this one says read the label and booklet before use before using and then it says keep out of reach of children so that has both of them the statement can be so um can say so this one added n booklet um as long as it basically says exactly what um that you have to read the label before you use the product and keep out of reach of children so um then you have the guarantee statement. So this is an example, and it says right on the label guarantee, and then it says diquad I on 240 grams per liter present as dibromide. Um, so the the guarantee statement lists the common chemical name and the uh, of the active ingredient or ingredients, whatever the case may be, and you and the concentration. Um, Next, you have the pest control products registration number. It must say registration no um, or registration number. 
and list the assigned number. Pest Control Products Act, um, it can be shortened to PCP Act. So, um, for example, here it says registration number 26396 and then Pest Control Products Act. So, um, it does have to have a declaration of the quantity of product in the package by volume if the product is a uh, liquid, gas, or viscous, and by mass if the product is a solid or pressure pack. Um, and lastly, the registrant's name and information. So it has to have the name, address, postal code, and phone number. This is the information you'll contact if you have a question. It has to be someone in Canada, and it's who you would contact, um, the public would contact if they have an inquiry regarding that product. So that this is all the information included on the primary display panel. And next, we're going to move on to the secondary display panel. Um, the secondary display panel has six components or headings. This is really the meat and potatoes of the label. When we say that the label is a law and you must read the label before using the product, um, unfortunately, for those ones that are 78 pages long, this is the, this is the part we're talking about. Um, so I don't have as many samples from um, samples from label in this section as their uh, every kind of every product it has they have to have certain headings but then the information for everyone is different so if you do have any questions about this part raise your hand up um, unmute yourself and say something or type it in the chat um, but we should be able to breeze through this um, so the headings on these labels are not always in the order but they will appear in that label. Um, so the first is the direction for use and this is where it'll tell you how to use the product. This includes things such as rates, timing, frequency of use and any application limitations including buffer zones. So next it has a hazard statement. Um, again this is the symbols and the, um, the symbols that we looked at earlier. So the triangle, diamond and hexagon or octagon and then the hazard symbols. And um, it this also has to identify any significant uh, risks associated with handling, storage, display, distribution, and or disposal of the product. So um, again, here is um, here's a sample warning harmful if fatal harmful or fatal if swallowed, harmful if inhaled, avoid inhaling, breathing dust, sprays, etc causes substantial eye injury and, and skin irritation, do not get in eyes or on skin or on clothing, never transfer to other containers, keep out of reach of children and animals. Um, so next is the precautions. Uh, this section lists any significant risks to health, the environment, wildlife, et cetera, and how to reduce that risk. And um, the next section is first aid. So this section is pretty self-explanatory. This is what to do in the event that you're poisoned, intoxicated, or injured, or injured caused by exposure to the product. This section must include the statement, take the container label or product name and pest control product registration number with you when seeking medical attention. So that, um, that information or that statement has to be on every label. Um, and then we have the toxicological information, and this is a bit of a continuation to the first aid section. It's a toxicological information. This section is essential to the treatment of poisoning, intoxication, or injury by the product. This section must include all the following information. So it must include antidotes and medial measures. If there are no antidotes or, or remedial measures, it must include the statement treat symptomatically. So you'll see that on, on quite a few of them. A description of the symptoms of poisoning or intoxication and a list of components of the product that may affect the treatment um, does not, it doesn't include the active ingredient. So lastly, there is uh, the notice to users. And this is, this is standard for all products. So notice to user, the pest control product is to be used only in accordance with the directions on the label. It is an offense under the Pest Control Products Act to use this product in a way that is 
inconsistent with the directions on the label, and the user assumes a risk of to persons or properties that arise from any such use of this product. Just one moment, I need to grab a, a drink of water here. Um, and I'm just going to just let you know here, I'm just going to click the um, attendance, take the attendance list right now. And just so um, I don't forget to forget to do that and bear with me, I got to get my screen set up here again. So um, just one more. Lastly, I said we are going to talk a little bit here on public trust. And so um, one of the things currently the use of pesticide can be not necessarily is, but can be a very uh, contentious issue globally. And um, the public perception of the pesticide industry we can all help as licensed pesticide applicators. We can help with the public perception of the pesticide industry. So some of the things you can do um, uh, is you can um, kind of do it, make sure you're doing things right. Uh, think you have kind of uh, what, think of how people like people that see if if people are seeing what you're doing, kind of their perception, sometimes their perception of what you're doing is not accurate. And I've had people who have um, been very upset by what they were seeing until someone explained to them what was um, what was going on and why they were doing what they were doing, and and uh, that they were when they understood the reason and realized that it was for their safety, um, they were much happier. Um, one, of, one of the perfect examples of that, and it has to do with an aerial applicator, was flying past, uh, there was organic property on one side of the road, on the other side there was a pasture with cattle, and, um, and they were spraying just to the west, I believe it was. Anyways, they flew past in between, and they did what's called a smoke pass just to see to actually visually see the way the wind was going and and to make sure that they weren't going to drift onto the organic property or the pasture property um and when the person saw this they were infuriated because they they saw the they saw the pesticide drift and were 100 percent certain that they had been drifted on and until um until we got a hold of the um the applicator and they explained what they were doing and why they did it um it, the person had a really bad perception of what of the applicator and then after that it kind of it helped um it helped them to understand oh they were doing that actually for my pr protection so um again that's just something that uh that is we, something we can help with one of the things that um that I, I like to remind people is that they, if somebody has a bad experience, they'll share that story with almost everybody that will listen to them. Um, if they have a average experience, they may share the story. They may not. If they have a good experience, they'll share it with you know a few of their closer friends. But right, so it can grow exponentially the number number of people who hear that story, and um, as as everyone shares it, sometimes it can get exaggerated or whatever um and sometimes it doesn't but that's that's just one of the things to keep in mind so um some of the one of the things that i tell people is is um the perception we can help the per perception by how we deal with people and explain things to people who don't necessarily understand um what it is that uh that we're doing so um, the other thing that i just quickly want to bring up here is field watch so we do have the field watch program um, available and this is something the government of Saskatchewan has purchased a license for this program and it marks um, sensitive areas to pesticides so it's something that um, something that you you can sign up for and you can see if there's organic or you know certain crops that are you know bees bees is another big thing if there's bee hives around if there's organic different sensitive crops so um, that's something that we have available to us as applicators and as um, as uh, you know people who have sensitive crops. So, other than that, 
that's a that's about it for my presentation today. Is there any questions from anybody? Uh, Norma, go ahead. Um, don't we don't use, we use uh, the uh, global, global harmonized system, system for uh, hazard ident identification now where the pictograms are a square on point? Um, and most of the new labels have that too, and it's uh, totally different than the old um, system. So when when I got the info the information, I um, I got it from the um, Pest Management Regulatory Agency because they they regulate the labels, and that's the information they provided me or provided me. And so that may be. Um, you may be accurate on that, and you know what? I will take a I will take a look at that because that's something that yeah, it's a totally different uh, hazard ID system. And that's the global harmonized, harmonized system. That's why the the world is sort of uh, common to the whole world. That's why they adopted it. You know what? That uh, I I think that would be something that would be. Um, I mean, that would be that would be good information that because it's important the hazard like what how hazardous it is and what the hazard is is important for anybody so i think that would be um to have it kind the of standardized. Are quite different too than they used to be you know what i will thank you for that i will have to i will have to take a look at that and i will have to uh double check with uh, the pest management regulatory agency to see if that's what they're using um on all new labels of course we're still going to have old labels in the system that um that Right until they re-register, I don't think they, I don't think they have to redo the label. So, I'm not sure, but I thought yeah. there was a time limit that they had to adopt to the SDS system from yeah, the old MDS. I I will check that. Might be with the safety data sheets, but I'll double check with uh, the pest management regulatory agency. And if you want to reach out to uh, your PHO, I can kind of get that information to them, and then and. Uh, Either they can contact you or I can contact you, but I'll, I'll follow up with you on that. Okay, thank you. And Norma Dresser? Yes. Okay, perfect. And what's, what division are you in? I am just uh, independent. I'm not with an RM. With, okay, so um, if you want to uh, to just put in the... Um, in the chat or something after the meeting, then I'll get your information so that we can, um, I can follow up on this for you. So, okay. um, Colleen, you have a? Yeah, she's division six. Division six, okay. Okay, perfect. And anybody else have any questions or anything? All right. So it looks like we're right at just about right Hello. at 12 o'clock. Oh, yep. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I just, I just want, I don't have a hand to put up here. I, I can't see it on my display okay. anything. So I, so I was just going to make sure that I'm registered now, like for, did, was I, was I marked present or? Uh, and this is? Don Hyde. Don Hyde. Yep. So. I'm just yeah. downloading. Oh, uh, okay, because I downloading the participant list, and I'm not sure why it's not. Um, I might have downloaded it 14 times because I've clicked it a bunch of times here. Um, okay. And okay, so, it never showed up on my it never showed up on my thing, so I just uh, okay, I couldn't put up my hand. So yeah. Okay. Nope. That's uh, that. I believe we have everybody everybody here and like I said I've downloaded the list and even with the recording it'll show um anybody else have any questions okay so if nobody has or if there's no more questions so um one of the things or the takeaways from this session I just want to review quickly here um, you must ensure that you read and understand the label prior to using any product um, and that you follow the label. This will decre decrease your risk of liability. 
again, the label is a law and should be treated as, as such. And if you have not already, please consider registering or checking out the Field Watch program. It's um, it's just a very useful information. Um, you can see if there's any sensitive areas around where you are. And um, other than that, so, oh, sorry, I have my question <laughs> slide up now. Um, is there anything else anyone has, um, questions or anything? If anybody's interested um, in seeing the, the label search tool, I can go through that just really quickly here. Um, if anyone wants to uh, take a look, but if not, um, if not, you can go ahead and uh, drop off the call here. I'm just going to just ask everyone to sit tight for one quick second. Um, I just want to make sure that I have the participant list. So I have uh, downloaded the participant list, but it's not showing me that it has downloaded. So I am going to um, just, uh, um, I'm just going to do that, um, take a screenshot of, of the people that have joined here just to make sure. And so I apologize, it's just taking a few minutes, but I just want to make sure that everybody gets their um, their their credits for the session. All right. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. It looks like I have, um, have everything that I need here. And uh, thank you so much for attending. I would say coming out on this crazy day, but none of us had to go out to attend this. So that's great. And everybody have a great day and take care. And if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out to your PHO or to reach out to me directly. They all have my contact information. And uh, I will provide them with a copy of the slides so that you can have that if you want a copy of the presentation and you will have then all of the links that I had included in the presentation. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day.